I've been in England now for 24 years, um, over two thirds of my life. I've grown up in England. Um, but, you know, one thing I've never lost is my accent. It's one thing that people still know is. I was born in Northern Ireland and I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be from Northern Ireland. Um, specifically Belfast. Uh, so, you know, you would think that I follow politics there extensively. Admittedly, I really don't. It's not that I don't think it's important. It's not that um, I don't think it's significant. But honestly, I am somewhat detached from the ground issues over there. It's not something like, for example, when I vote, I'm, my choice is between Labour, Conservative and Liberal Democrat. It's not between DUP and Sinn Féin. So my my focus isn't really on the province. But, you know, inevitably, as questions come into the fore in the future, I, I will definitely think more about it. I was in Scotland on referendum day 2014, i.e. the referendum on Scottish independence. And although I'd been to Edinburgh shortly before that, I, I bought a train ticket and I went up there because I felt it was fundamentally important. I believe in the United Kingdom and so any prospect of Northern Ireland basically dissolving and the United Ireland happening it is something I would certainly be very interested in um, and I would feel a good deal of sadness for sure. Um, but before I get into my personal thoughts on this, I, I do welcome the return of power sharing. It's definitely important. There's nothing worse than uncertainty you know, for businesses, for people waiting for NHS treatment uh, and all the other things that people in Northern Ireland have had to put up with for the last two years. A uh, very good photograph here in the Times. It shows the Prime Minister with the new First Minister. Very historic. A lot's been said about this. The first nationalist First Minister, Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin um, and Deputy First Minister Emma Little-Pangeli. Now, despite the name Deputy, they have equal power, but the significance of having the first national first minister in Northern Ireland is important. Um, this is a good photograph. She's the prime minister and uh, the two women now running Northern Ireland. Now, a lot's been made of the fact that Michelle O'Neill's father was an IRA prisoner, but I have to say she, she was diplomatic in her first speech. She said that she would serve everyone. Uh, she said that she respected the feelings of unionists, you know, it was, some would argue it's the DUP that have held things up in the last two years, but she was quick to stress that she would serve everyone, um, and she respected the British identity of unionists. I think that's very important, because, you know, I don't have time in this video to go through all the ins and outs of the troubles, but one of the, one of the origin factors there was the treatment of Catholics in the late 60s and early 70s, and the issue of civil rights. So if there was any fears that it would go the other way and unionist rights were not respected, then, you know, that would not bode well for the future. So I think it's important that she made that diplomatic gesture. Um, but she's also, you know, highlighted the possibility of reunification in the next decade or a poll on that. Uh, Rishi Sunak's pointed out that they should be focusing on day-to-day sort of -day issues. She's also said that the 3.3 billion financial package isn't enough. Um, Sunak so saying that they need to focus on everyday issues. The most important thing here is there's not a breakdown in power sharing because that will only mean more uncertainty for the people of Northern Ireland. Even the old Farrakhan hasn't called for or hasn't said the time is right for a referendum. I'm just going to read out this piece on the notion of unification. It's from the Times from uh, February the 6th. Uh, the Times doesn't name the journalists in these individual editorials. So I'm just going to read this out. When Michelle O'Neill, Northern Ireland's uh, new First Minister, said there would be a referendum on Irish unity within the next decade, um, it was as much a statement of reassurance to nationalists as it was one of aspiration. Uh, Oliver Wright writes, so this piece by Oliver Wright. She was sending a message to Sinn Féin supporters that the party's long-term aims had not been forgotten. So what is a border poll? When would it be triggered? And what are the prospects of a United Ireland within the timescale O'Neill gave? One of the key components of the 1998 Good Friday peace deal 
um, was that the British government would not stand in the way of Irish reunification if that was what the people of Northern Ireland wanted. In the legislation underpinning the deal, the Northern Ireland uh, Secretary obliged uh, is obliged excuse me, to call a referendum on the issue if it appears likely that most voters in the North will support the change. If 50% of voters in the province, as well as a majority in a separate poll in the Republic, back reunification, it will be started. The legislation does not define how the government would define likely, but most experts believe the basis would be the respected annual Life and Time Survey of Northern Irish Public Opinion that has been running since 1998. It asks questions across a range of issues and is the most reliable indicator of sentiment in the province. What the survey shows is that although there has been a rise in support for unification since 1998, it's far from the done deal that O'Neill suggested. The survey also indicates that power sharing can be restored, unification may become less likely. And if I could just interject there, well, she's a nationalist, of course, she's going to be pitching for a referendum, just like the Scottish nationalists do and the Welsh nationalists do. It's kind of to be expected. Ten years ago, the survey found that 66% of uh, voters support Northern Ireland remaining part of the UK and 17% support reunification. So that was around 2014. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised it wasn't higher at that time. Uh, the most recent survey, which was carried out in 2022 after power sharing collapsed, found that support for staying in the UK has fallen to 48% and 31% back to unification. In 2014, only 9% of those who said they were they had no religion were in favour of reunification. Uh, that's now risen to 33%, so that's an interesting demographic change. Digging into the numbers, it becomes clear that the biggest rise in support for reunification has been among those who do not identify as either Catholic or Protestant. That's interesting, because with Northern Ireland, politics is often homed in on Catholic Protestant, but there is another component. Equally, there have been big demographic differences. In 2014, 42% of 18 to 24 year olds and 47% of 25 to 34 year olds were in favour of Northern Ireland remaining in the UK with a devolved government. The most recent data shows that only 20% and 27% of these voters respectively are in favour of the present devolution settlement. O'Neill would argue that this supports the idea that reunification is inevitable in the longer run, but could equally be argued that if power sharing could be restored in a way that directly benefits people in Northern Ireland, as it was a decade ago, trust in the settlement can be restored. The poll in 2022 was taken at the low point of post-Brexit wrangles and there's more stability now than there was then. Northern Ireland's post-Brexit status may infuriate some unionists, but it does uh, offer the potential of huge economic benefits to the province that would uh, not have in the United Ireland. The province uh, is now the only part of the British Isles able to enjoy frictionless trade with Britain and with the European Union. With political stability, this is likely to bring big investment as businesses seek to take advantage of this unique status. On top of this, if Sinn Féin does come to power in the Republic, which polls suggest is possible, reunification's allure among non-aligned voters may fade. Sinn Féin is still regarded with deep suspicion by moderate unionists and centrist voters, and incidentally by the late uh, Taoiseach, Mr Bruton, who passed away a few days ago, and he played an important role in the peace process. John Major, Tony Blair and others have praised his work. Um... My take on this is, you know, she's a national, so of course she's going to pitch that. But I think now that power sharing has been restored, she, it would be misguided, especially after that diplomatic speech that she gave, to be talking about this so early on. They need to focus on everyday issues, health care, crime, you know, the sort of things that people are concerned about in England, Scotland and Wales, um, not on a divisive pole. That time may come. It may come within 10 years but not right now, because I think that will only polarise unionists. And the last thing that Northern Ireland needs is a breakdown in power sharing. You know, no one wants a return to the troubles, and there's no sign that that's going to happen. But um, these women need to work together and, you know, show that they will work together. They're going to have disagreements, but I think they are a different generation. And in that sense, it's a good thing. Um, I think Northern Ireland is in a better place than it was. You know, I'm British. I would be very, very saddened to see the dissolving of Northern Ireland, but that is not something 
if that prospect happens, if that if there's a referendum, then I'll definitely talk about this more closer to the time. But for now, the most important thing in Northern Ireland is the survival of power sharing and the tackling of day to day issues, as both women have promised they will do. And, you know, if it's a question of more money, well, that's negotiations with the British government. But power sharing has to survive. That's the most important thing. Let me know your thoughts.